you. Thanks very much for the invitation to present today. It's very um, nice to be here and um, very excited to show to show you what we've been doing, um, part of the research in our lab. Um, I just thought I'd start off by introducing our lab. We call ourselves the Sustainable Food Production Research Group at Griffith Uni, and we're a member of the Centre for Planetary Health and Food Security. There's a, a link there. You can go and find out more about the centre there if you'd like to. Um, I'm a member of a group that also includes another presenter today, so Ido Barr. He'll be telling you about another one of our research programs, but we've got a, a few other research fellows and a number of PhD students that are currently enrolled with us. Um, the sorts of programs we generally work on are today, I'll be talking to you about our biosensor for development for diagnostics of plant pathogens, but we also do work on looking at the evolution and adaptation of fungal species. And again, Edo is gonna talk about one of those today. Um, we lead the National Papaya Breeding Program, which has a lot of work in it to do with breeding for better quality and flavour, but also a bit of pathology in it too, um, that we collaborate with the Queensland Department of Ag. And um, uh, Edo is also leading another program on flavour and sensory profiling genomics work in papaya. So we've got a myriad of, of partners and investors um, that we work with there. But today I'm going to talk to you about the power of um, electrochemical biosensors and particularly focusing on this um, pathogen uh, or disease Botrytis gray mold and the pathogens that cause that in temperate legumes. So um, for those of you that don't know, um, Botrytis species are necrotrophic fungal pathogens and they infect um, a lot of different host crops across the agricultural, horticultural and ornamental um, plant world. Um, the main pathogens on temperate legumes are Botrytis cinerea, the, the major pathogen, but this um, Botrytis fabi can co-occur with Botrytis cinerea on a couple of different crops, including faba bean and lentil. Um, together, they, they cost the Australian temperate legume industry quite a lot of money each year. And that was a survey that was done a few years ago now. So I expect it's probably potentially even worse now that we are experiencing a couple of more wet years and, and, and the cropping industries have started to expand um, so why, why do we want better diagnostic tools for this particular um, pathogen um, for informing disease management? Well, it's really for us at the moment, it's for application to surveil, to, for surveillance and monitoring. Um, and then that the information that's generated would then go into better informing the decision-making um, and that includes the use and the timing of fungicides because currently there's an, a massive amount of fungicides that are poured onto the crops uh, based on uh, the best modeling that we currently have, but it's, it's more around predictive rainfall um, and not necessarily on knowledge of what's actually in the paddocks. So to be a good diagnostic tool, it, it obviously needs to be accurate. So specific to the target organism, um, sensitive, in, in other words, able to um, uh, identify or predict the presence of the pathog pathogen prior to symptomology development for the best um, use of fungicides. Um, quantitative, so um, really good to know the loads of inoculum out there in the paddock. Um, and um, then marrying that information up with knowledge on the epidemic potential, which um, is, is growing. Um, the uh, diagnostic needs to be relatively fast to be useful in the paddock, um, affordable and portable, um, as well as robust, so reliable within the cropping environment. So that comes to the validation work that I'll talk about uh, at the end of my presentation. Really what happened for me and my group was um, I was sitting in a PhD confirmation seminar. Actually, no, it was the end of, end of uh, it was our thesis candidate review milestone, which is at the end of the PhD. 
and I was listening to um, this particular student give a talk about how they produce these biosensors to detect analytes in, in human um, saliva and urine that were then use, useful for, for uh, determining potential for, for cancer. Um, and this fellow here, um, Mohammed Shadiki, uh, and I then decided that we would look at translating that exact technology pretty much from what he was doing with cancer research to see whether we could make it work for, for uh, plant pathogens and, and agriculture and horticultural applications. And that's when we um, found a suitable student, that's Marzia Bilkis there. And she, what I'm about to present is, is quite a lot of the work from her PhD thesis. So along the way, we've published a couple of review articles, but I'm still working on that um, main um, scientific publication that you'll hear about. Uh, the work that I'll, I'll present today. So what is a nanobiosensor? Well, it's a device that measures uh, an event, whether it be biochemical or biological, using generally uh, several different ways of detecting that event. Um, uh, they can be electronic, they can be an optical uh, signal, um, and it's usually collected using some sort of probe. Um, so Biosensors commonly comprise a biological recognition molecule, um, or otherwise known as a bioreceptor, uh, that's immobilized onto the surface of a signal transducer um, that then recognizes the analyte which is being uh, sought and subsequently transmits a signal that's detectable, as I said. So the analyte, well, and often in biomedical research is called a biomarker, um, is from, in our world, usually the causal organism or the pathogen. Um, it could be a secondary pathogen product or it could be a host product. Um, and um, most of what we work with relates to nucleic acid, but it could also be uh, the product um, from a protein expression or some other metabolite. Um, they, they're fished out then using a capture probe that attaches them to the bioreceptor surface. And the bioreceptor surface um, will often then comprise nanomaterials that enable the, the separation of that initial captured analyte from the rest of the soup of the background that it's been fished out of. Um, then allows concentration of that analyte and then subsequent diagnosis and quantification. And often this uses a secondary capture probe to do this. So I'm sort of very simplistically going through the steps here because it, it is complex. It sounds simple, it is quite complex and it's taken me a while to get my head around this as well. Um, and the complex binding then creates a chemical signal that's captured by the transducer. Um, and in, in the work that we've done, that signal is then converted into an electrical signal that's then detected. Um, in other work, a lot of other previous work and ongoing work, the capture probe may use an enzyme that convert, converts the signal to a co color change. And you know, a good example of that would be a pregnancy test kit and some of the diagnostic um, test kits we're seeing evolving currently with our, with our particular pandemic that's occurring. Um, so just to go through this again, um, the target analyte for us is, is a leaf or a sap um, sample or a fol foliar sample because we're working with necrotrophic foliar pathogens. The um, analyte that we actually extract then is, is, a, is a nucleic acid. Um, that's then captured using a functionalized biosensor molecule um, that then stimulates an electrochemical change that's then detected. So why have we gone for the electrochemical route as opposed to the immunoassay or down the sort of color change uh, route? Um, there's, there's reasons why you would go down the much faster color change route, you get a very instantaneous signal, but you can't quantify that necessarily. So 
and particularly not using the methodologies that we're trying to apply here. So really, it's a way of using very small, easy to use and low cost devices. Um, the binding leads to a change in current or voltage and the change in that charge distribution after binding is captured by the transducer, as I said. And in, in, a, tra in a nano biosensor, so the transducer comprises a nano material with the advantages that yes, they're very small nano particles, but they have very high total surface areas. So you're likely to capture quite a bit more there. Um, the ability to bind probes for secondary capture is also there. And there are other chemical properties that different nanoparticles can be loaded with to enable further functionality, such as magnetic separation. And in the case of the particles we're using, um, an oxidative uh, reaction that occurs that leads to the stimulation of that electrochemical signal. So really what I want you to do is just imagine in real time, if we could implement nanobiosensors for informed disease management, we're really supporting real time decision-making by providing the growers with rapid and accurate diagnosis and quantification, but also feeding into more accurate uh, modeling around epidemics. Um, and so therefore these are very useful for that continuous surveillance and monitoring that would feed into this um, holistic decision-making process. Um, now our target pathogens, as I, as I told you before, were the species that, that uh, caused Botrytis um, disease, Botrytis gray mold. So our, the aims of this particular part of our research was to develop, um, first of all, molecular probes, no, no uh, sorry, nucleic acid probes, that are attached to the nanoparticles for electrochemical biosensors. Um, and then we also wanted to quantify those target organisms, but also discriminate them. So they're discrete from each other, knowing that they co-occur in the field and therefore understanding the ratio of that co-occurrence into the future would probably better inform that disease management. So, we needed to determine the limits of detection, um, and we did that using titrated pure fungal DNA standards to begin with to create some standard curves. Um, we then wanted to diagnose, discriminate, and quantify the species within the plant host backgrounds um, because potentially there's going to be interference from other um, molecules, metabolites that occur in that particular environmental background. We then wanted to use them to quantify them in the field, um, again, under the environmental conditions that the plants actually grow in and that the pathogens actually occur in. And then we wanted to determine if the biosensors were useful to detect potential latent infection, knowing that latent infection of Botrytis species is, is a really big problem in, in many um, industries. So the first thing we had to do was to find our best possible target analytes, nucleic acids, probes, all names for the same thing. Um, so we needed to find sequences that were um, conserved for the target um, species, but discriminatory among them. And they're quite closely related taxonomically. So the first um, effort was to source um, a published primer pair, a couple of primer pairs from the literature from FAN et al. Um, back in 2015. And we just went ahead and used those primers um, as probes um, and just initially did some traditional PCR on a set of isolates that we collected over the years and from the most recent cropping seasons. Um, mostly from faba bean, um, lentil, and we had um, one from chickpea and grape as well. So we had a few isolates from cinerea, of cinerea and a few of faden. And what we found was that the, we also included the, um, the type isolates from the ATCC collection um, for cinerea and faden. And what we found was that the the published cinerea primers were not 
able to amplify from the typed isolate despite, despite us trying multiple times to get this to work and also didn't pick up one of our isolates from, from the Kingsford region down in South Australia. So it was not consistent. The good thing was that it didn't amplify anything from Botrytis baby. So, and on the flip side, the Botrytis baby published um, probes, they didn't amplify from Cinerea, but they also amplified all the Fabi um, isolates that we that we tried it again. So, you know, we, we sort of thought we could do better. We needed to find more consistent um, probe for Botrytis Cinerea for the Australian situation. Um, so we then sought other literature that specifically um, published around Petrotus cinerea um, specific sequences and tried a few of those. I won't go through all of the trials and errors. You can imagine a lot of PCRs um, and repeat amplifications trying to get these to work. Um, we ended up actually redesigning some primers um, and we actually did use the NET1 gene, the NET NECRIT process ethylene inducing protein sequence and we redesigned these and we're able to come up with very consistent um, Botrytis cinerea specific um, amplification um, and Fabi um, specific amplification. So this was pretty much where we landed with um, determining our analytes as uh, targets to go forward with. We then wanted to see how sensitive these were on pure fungal DNA. So we developed a tenfold titration series from um, 10 femtograms up to 10 nanograms. And you can see clearly here, a very nice standard curve was produced for both of those with very high R squared um, amounts. So pretty happy with those. And um, we then went on to <laughs> generate our uh, genome calculation um, from the amplification that we um, achieved. And uh, I won't go through that, but um, we've had it tried and tested and we're pretty sure we're onto a good thing. And you, you can have a look at this in, if you want to go back and look at the slides later on. Um, so um, effectively what we came up with was uh, um, from, a, from a sort of a traditional PCR, uh, sorry, qPCR perspective um, and using that, that titration where we had a, a threshold of detection around 100 femtograms per microliter, which equated to about two genomes per qPCR reaction, which is pretty good um, and probably sensitive enough, um, to be honest. But then we wanted to convert this to something else, to, to uh, um, an, another sort of sensor device, um, as I've explained. Um, so the next thing we needed to do is just check the sensitivity in a plant background. So um, we created a bioassay and we sprayed some plants with different concentrations of the, of the fungus um, separately. And, uh, and we, our controls were obviously just, just water. Um, we um, also used positive controls from our um, from our um, ATCC collection um, isolates, and um, what we found was that you know just using PCR traditional PCR, we our detection threshold in a plant background was when the plants were sprayed with about ten to the five spores per mil, which equated you know to about hundred spores per microliter. So not particularly sensitive. <laughs> um, so then um, moving on to qPCR, um, we again inoculated the plants. With, we actually used the same plant material. We collected the tissues at 24, 36 and 48 hours after inoculation. And we then um, took 100 milligrams of leaf tissue and extracted the total um, DNA from that and use that as our template. Um, some interesting observations, some thoughts here. Um, first of all, it's un unlikely that the inoculum was um, evenly distributed across the whole of the plant material. So you've got to think about what does a 100 milligram sample actually represent in the real world. Um, it was um, 
obvious that the fungal amounts increase over time. So uh, there's obviously a, a growth of the fungal material occurring on the plant material. Um, and um, interestingly, despite the fact that we assume the same amount of inoculum is applied in all cases, um, uh, consistently more Petritus cinerea was, was, um, uh, was detected than Petritus baby um, amounts of fungus. Um, so this sort of led us to um, an initial thought around maybe the cinerea bioreceptor was potentially more sensitive than the Botrytis JP1. Um, so the next step really was for us to convert this to an electro nano biosensor as a mouthful. And the first thing was uh, to show you here is how we um, um, collect, how we captured the, the, the targets, the analytes. So um, Again, material, the plants were inoculated um, and the DNA was extracted. And, and again, a reminder that this is plant and fungal material. Um, the um, DNA is then heated to produce single strands and then incubated with the target capture probe or bioreceptor. Um, and that's, that probe is either Cinerea or Fabi specific. It's also, um, has a biotinylated sequence bound to it that's useful for then fishing out using uh, dynabeads which have streptavidine coated on them. Once that's fished out, we can, we can magnetically separate um, that from the soup, from the background um, solution, and we can then release that uh, once it's separated out and, and concentrated um, uh, to go forward with. Um, so that's then um, put, pipetted onto a screen printed carbon electrode, an SPCE, you'll see that come up later, um, which one, once it's on the electrode, it binds with the nanoparticles, which are gold plated, um, the gold loaded ferric oxide nanoparticles, which also create creates then a redox reaction through a, a RU hexide um, electrocatalytic cycle, which um, exchanges electrons. Um, I'm not a chemist. That's how I can explain it. I'm sure there may be chemists on board that, that know more about this reaction, but it's a very well published um, uh, phenomenon. But that electrocatalytic exchange then creates an electrochemical signal. Um, and that the intensity of that signal then translates back to the amount of fungal target um, uh, by analyte that was captured in the very first place. So it's, it's a pretty elegant method, um, which, which doesn't need amplification. That's the, the big point here. You don't need a PCR reaction. Um, the PCR reaction was just to test the specificity and sensitivity of, of those, of those uh, bioreceptor uh, sequences that we use. So we then wanted to test the specificity of our bioreceptor probes, if you like, um, similarly to the way we've done using PCR. Um, so we, we used our, um, our ATCC um, isolates and we tested those, that, that method I've just described in various ways with various controls where we just used a bare electrode. We then used the electrode with the RUHEX on it to stimulate catalytic exchange with and without the, um, the DNA, the, the uh, uh, bioreceptors and with and without the um, pure fungal DNA being applied to it. Um, so you can see there's on this table, there are uh, instances where we're testing the Fabi bioreceptor with Cinerea DNA, and we're testing the Cinerea receptor with Fabi DNA. So they're like the cross reactions that we're testing for. And then these are the positive response reactions that we're hoping to see work really well with the Fabi or the Cinerea 
receptor being tested with the Fabi or the Cineria um, analyte or, or um, DNA. And here's, here's some um, results from that. So you can see the bare electrode next to no, nothing there, nothing uh, significant. Um, then you're stepping through using the um, electrode with, without the RUHEX. Um, you still get a little bit of a signal, but it's, it's still considered the background signal. Um, again, um, when you add the, the DNA, um, there's a, there's a non-significant difference. I would consider that between there. There's the no template again, non-significant. And then you start to see what happens when you put, um, this one is uh, Cineria DNA on a Fabi probe, next to no signal, the same with the Cineria, uh, Fabi on the Cineria probe. And then you see the response, the positive response of the Fabi DNA on the Fabi probe and the Cineria DNA on the Cineria probe. And the note here is that it is around the strongest signal again that we're seeing uh, with the positive reaction from the Cineria probe, which is really interesting um, and needs to be considered later on. So looking at the sensitivity of these probes, again, using uh, the same titration series that we used for the qPCR reactions, uh, we were able to show a very nice standard curve here again, and that uh, our kind of our uh, threshold of detection was around 10 femtograms, um, which is relates down to less than a, a, a single fungal spore. So, you, you know, it's, it's as sensitive as it could possibly be, uh, in other words. And we had a, a very similar uh, reaction for the, um, the Fabi um, biosensor probe using, again, the pure fungal DNA and the titration series, some really nice R squares there. Um, and, and by no means did this happen overnight. This was a huge amount of optimization and, and replication that's sitting behind all of these very easy to present graphs that uh, Marcia did a huge amount of work to, to produce. Um, again, it's really interesting to see if you have a look at the, um, the axis there, um, that the signal detected using the Fabi probes, if I quickly flip back, was about a third of that detected using the, sorry, the Fabi probe was about a third of that detected using the, the Cineria probe. So again, showing um, probably a drop in sensitivity for whatever reason. We then looked at the electrobiochemical uh, sensitivity of detection in, in, uh, in planter. So um, we treated the plants similarly to what I've shown you before with different spore loadings. Um, again, just spray inoculated. So again, you have to consider homogeneity of, of, of the spores on the plant surface. And again, extracted 100 milligrams of leaf tissue collected at different time points after inoculation. Um, and this is just uh, showing you that at 24 hours after inoculation, uh, we're able to detect down to 10 to, the, 10 to the two spores per mil. So, you know, a shift of, of, is it two or threefold from the detection using traditional PCR. Um, and again, you can see a very nice um, standard curve here that instead of titration of DNA, pure fungal DNA, it relates to the spore loading uh, onto the plants here. Uh, again, um, just pointing out that the detection, the signal detected with the pure fungal DNA um, with the Fabi was about half of the signal detected with, with the Cineria DNA and probes. So we're looking, this is just the results in a time series here. Um, and just to show you that the sensitivity was of detection was robust across the time points assessed. Um, and importantly, um, and this is just the three time points, importantly, it's, um, this is long before um, characteristics of the disease are, are visible. So long before you'll see any symptomology or even 
um, that kind of fluffy white mycelial growth occurring in the field. So we're really talking, um, you know, within within two days here. So the next really important step for us to was to then take this to the field and, and, and make it as compact as possible to validate um, for various reasons. Um, and um, we undertook this using uh, two different trials, two different experiments, sets of experiments, one in the Shade House at, um, at the Wake Campus in Adelaide um, and working alongside partners at um, Saudi there, um, Jenny Davidson and, um, and colleagues. And then the other field site um, testing was also in partnership with, with those colleagues, but going out to real field sites um, of Faber Bean. Um, across South Australia. Um, and is, I mean, it's not a single handheld device at this point in time. It is still um, a set of, of, of small instruments that would be able to be plugged into a car and, um, a, you know, sort of a, a, a quick kit that's used to, to do a rough extraction and a quick spin um, to um, get the, the the alluded sort of nucleic acid containing solution here through onto, onto our handheld homogenizer and then into the, the sensing device. Um, so it, in, on, in all honesty, this fits in a suitcase that Marzia <laughs> took on a plane and went down to Adelaide to use. So we, we still call it portable at this stage. So uh, at the Wake campus, we looked at three lentil cultivars, and this was part of their annual trials um, that were going on. So we were lucky enough to coincide with what was going on for them. And we kind of worked in with that. And those trials had been um, sprayed with, with, a, with the same method I've just talked about, just handheld sprayed inoculum with equal parts of spore inoculum from Botrytis cinerea and Botrytis baby in a, in a mixed spore state, uh, two by 10 to the five spores per mil of each of those um, two, two um, spores. And then we extracted the leaves at 24 and 48 hours after inoculation. Ob more observations and thoughts. Um, you can see here that um, generally, Again, more fungus was detected over time, 24, uh, 48 hours compared to 24 hours. Um, potentially, there's a cultivar influence here, and I'm yet to check, but is cultivar bulk, for instance, more susceptible to Botrytis cinerea? And, you know, if so, potentially there's a, um, you know, there's something on the other cultivars that's uh, retarding the growth of the fungus over that time period, that initial sort of establishment period. Um, and again, more Botrytis cinerea was detected um, than Botrytis baby, despite the same quantity of inoculum applied at the very beginning. Um, and that equated to about a 1.5 times more growth of Botrytis cinerea than Botrytis baby in a single mixed spore inoculum on a single plant. Um, so in other words, and that had been adjusted uh, for the probe sensitivities of one to three that we kind of determined from our previous work. So the big question is, is this, is this an example of real-time competition going on? And um, we're yet to, to confirm that with some further work um, by doing some nice histopathology. The other field trial that we did was in three field sites across um, South Australia, so real field trials. And um, they were sampled in 2020 from both, both, this is important to note, both sym symptomatic and asymptomatic um, tissues. And this is what the tissues look like. So you can see the symptoms there versus the clean tissues that were collected. Um, and the inoculum was natural infection. Um, and so the expectation was that we would, um, because this was favor being, that we would um, be able to detect both cinerea and favor. 
Um, we collected five symptomatic and five asymptomatic clients per site. And the results showed us that we had similar levels of fungus detected across all sites, slightly more at Mandela. Um, but also surprisingly similar levels in, were detected in, symptom, in asymptomatic tissues as they were collected in symptomatic tissues. Um, so, wow, that, that's interesting for us um, because it sort of then starts us thinking about that whole kind of increase in fungal biomass and, and whether uh, the fungus is, is increasing in biomass in, in that time frame without creating symptoms. Um, there were some outliers with significantly more fungus detected, um, and we're not sure how to explain that, except that we know that epidemics are not always occurring evenly across a, a paddock. So that then sort of brings me to the last point I want to make, um, is around the importance of diagnostics of latent infection, because if we're detecting similar amounts of of fungal, essentially amount of fungus on asymptomatic tissues as we are on symptomatic tissues without symptoms being apparent, it does indicate that there is some latent uh, um, growth of the, of the fungus occurring, which is a huge problem we know in other um, cropping industries. Um, and if we can understand more about this, it would definitely inform our predictive epidemic modelling more, not just the presence of the pathogen, but presence prior to symptomology. Um, and of course, then also relates to post-harvest sanitation and, and you know, the use of clean seeds going forward for the industry. So um, in summary, um, we've developed biosensors to detect both of our target pathogens. They're highly specific. We're able to discriminate among those two pathogens. And I'll also add that there was quite a bit of background bioinformatics work done to make sure that nothing else was going to be picked up um, that was uh, genetically closely related to those targets and would occur in a chickpea paddock or a faba bean paddock or a lentil paddock. Um, they're highly sensitive, so we can detect down to single genomes or spores. It's pretty fast using our suitcase kit takes about 45 minutes to get a quantified, quantified positive result. Um, it's portable, um, it's durable. So we've shown that those, um, um, uh, the, the, those that the methods that we use, uh, they don't degrade, the, 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 um, they're, they're there and they're present for us to use over and over again. In fact, you can use the same nanoparticles if you wanna wash them off and use them again, they're ready to use. Um, it's affordable um, and um, just in, depending on numbers that obviously you want to chug through the system, it's definitely going to be less than one dollar per sample includes of, of salary. Um, and it's reasonably easy, easy to use, although we're still working on that. Um, so, you know, I think the results of this research really will help to inform better disease management um, on being able to guide biologically and geographically on the use of chemicals, uh, reducing the excess or unnecessary application of chemicals, although <laughs> Cineria is pretty endogenous and spread throughout systems. Um, hopefully that will then lead to better grower returns and, and reduced environmental impacts. And I want to finish up very much by acknowledging the whole team because it's, it's not just the people that I'll mentioned quickly, but it, you know, it's all of the breeders and agronomists and the growers that, that are helping us with the research and making field sites available, etc. Um, I want to really thank Shadiki because he's the brains behind the electro biochemical um, bi uh, biosensor methodology. Marcia is the person that's done a lot of the work. He knows help with the bioinformatics side of this. Sam is our go-to person for sort of confirming things biologically through his, his the biology, et cetera. Uh, Jenny in the industry, Jeremy has very much helped with supervision and, and um, the ideas. Um, and there's some references to those two review articles that we've got out so far. So 
and they're the sponsors of that exact piece of work. So thank you very much for listening and I welcome any questions and hopefully I can answer them.